Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to another special episode of Vantage Ventures Real Talks. Uh, my name is Isaac Obiyama, and we are really happy to be bringing you uh, another episode here during Black History Month, as we not only have the opportunity to bring in some amazing entrepreneurs of color, but also do a little bit more of a deep dive into the world of fintech. Um, this is part of Vantage Ventures Diversify, our initiative focused on recruiting diverse entrepreneurship to Appalachia. And I'll spare you all the details of that right now. But uh, if you'd like more information, please go ahead and check out our Facebook and LinkedIn page uh, for more information. So uh, before I go any further, I really want to thank our partners of this event. First, the WVU Dice Committee, uh, the Chambers College Diversity, Inclusion, Culture and Equity Committee. Uh, it's a volunteer committee comprised, comprised of WVU faculty, staff and students. Uh, and they're really focused on celebrating, championing, and embedding diversity, equity, inclusion into the culture of the Chambers College. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Encova Center. Uh, they serve small businesses through direct coaching, targeted trainings and workshops and support growth. Uh, the center also helps facilitate mutual bene mutually beneficial partnerships uh, between the college and West Virginia business owners through strategic business consulting. Um, so thank you so much to our partners. Uh, this event will also be a fireside chat or as I've coined it, kind of a video Yule log chat. Uh, via uh, Sarah, uh, via internet with Sarah Bill and our guest, Adrian Harris. Uh, Sarah is the executive director of Vantage Ventures and is also the co-founder of the FinTech Sandbox. Uh, she was most recently the chief operating officer for innovation at State Street Bank's Global Exchange Division uh, and head of Innovation Ventures. And of course, our special guest, Adrian Harris. Uh, Adrian is a professor of the practice at the University of Michigan, uh, as well as a senior uh, research fellow with the Center for Finance, Law and Policy at the university. Uh, Adrian is an early stage investor and advisor. Uh, she also advises fintech companies, incumbent financial uh, institutions, and large venture uh, capital firms. Most recently, Adrian was the uh, founding chief business officer and general counsel of State's Title. Uh, and Adrian currently serves on the board of directors for the Financial Health Network for Beneficial State Bank. Uh, she also serves as a limited partner advisor to the NYCA uh, and a term member for the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, she previously served as the uh, International Technology Advisory Panel for the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore. So uh, as well as Adrian, she was also a uh, special assistant to President uh, Barack Obama for economic policy at the National Economic Council uh, in the Obama White House, where her portfolio included financial reform, financial technology, uh, cybersecurity, consumer protection, uh, and housing reform. At the White House, Adrian spearheaded the development of the administration's fintech strategy, chairing both the Interagency FinTech Working Group and the administration's Distributed Ledger Technology Task Force. Uh, she came to the White House from the U.S. Department of Treasury, where she served as the senior advisor uh, to the deputy secretary. So no stranger to the world of FinTech and an absolutely successful individual. So it's a true honor to have her spare a little bit of time to just impart some wisdom on us uh, and dive deep into the world of FinTech. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to give a virtual round of applause and welcome to uh, Adrian A. Harris. Thanks so much, Isaac. Isaac, thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, as Isaac mentioned, I'm Sarah Biller, and um, I am deeply, deeply honored to join today and talk about, or talk with, not about, there's been so many words said, but with uh, my dear friend, Adrian Harris. Um, Adrian, I, I, I think I listen, as I listen through Isaac uh, talking about your many accomplishments, I couldn't help but recall why we met. And how we met, and and in that way, you know, the, it really speaks volumes about you. And I'll just share thirty seconds of it. You actually took my call um, when you were actually advising the leader of the free world on fintech. <laughs> let's re let's remember how busy you were and the scope of your responsibilities, thinking about cyber, thinking about consumer protection, emerging technologies. And here, I came to you and said, I really dream about fintech and how we make a better world. And you sat with me and you actually shared your vision then. And we, we became friends all these years later. And I just, I applaud you for what you've done and where you, where you're, what you, where you've come from and where you're going. And I thought maybe we ought to start with your origin story. I think everyone really wants to know you as a person first um, and how you really, really aspired. What, what inspired you to be here? Maybe a little bit about what challenged you, but can you share a little bit about your origin story? Yeah, happy to. And, and thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for having me and, and Isaac for your introduction, for, for all your partners. Um, this is really an honor to be here. Um, and it was so much fun to meet you um, then at the at the White House. I, you know, I don't know who wouldn't take your call, Sarah, to be to be honest. <laughs> 
Um, and your guidance and counsel was so helpful as we were sort of feeling our way through an agenda for FinTech. Uh, so, and your friendship has been so invaluable since then. So thank you. Um, origin story. I mean, I, you know, I've had sort of this eclectic professional journey, but I also had this sort of eclectic upbringing. Um, you know, my, my mother grew up, um, super poor uh, in the Bronx in New York. My father grew up relatively middle class, but in segregated Maryland. Um, they met at Harvard Medical School, um, you know, as two African-Americans in the 70s, which is sort of unusual then. And then I sort of grew up in this bucolic, partly in this bucolic New England setting um, where we were, we were the only family of, of color uh, around. And then we moved to the Southwest and I, you know, had a really diverse set of, of friends um, and, you know, always had interest in lots of different things. Um, but, you know, grew up with a sense from my, from my parents and from my family of, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. So I always knew that service was going to be a component of my career, whether it was true public service or finding a way to leverage my private sector experiences to be of service. You know, I remember my parents owned this small medical practice in this itty bitty town uh, in New England. And they, you know, they were so ahead of their time because they provided a retirement program for their employees and, you know, and all like healthcare benefits and all these things, um, even though it was such a small practice. Um, and they would, you know, help pay for their employees' children to go to college and to summer camp and all these other things. And my parents just always sort of drove home this message to me of, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And they, you know, they also really impressed upon me um, how much of my life and how much, how many of my advantages were just luck, right? That I was born to them and, you know, that they had managed to have some success of their own, right? But I could have been born to other parents or, you know, other families who just didn't have the advantages that they had. Um, and so they always impressed upon me that as, as hard as I worked and as much as I would earn, you know, good grades in school, um, that really the foundation of all of that was was luck. Um, and so that I owed it uh, to myself and to to others to try and, and give back. And that's just something I've I've tried to do uh, in various ways throughout my career. And then you know, well, I'm sure we'll talk more about um, challenges, but I think the other thing that's motivated me aside from that, um, that sort of upbringing, you know, in in some ways sort of uh, in a different perspective was like people in my career telling me I couldn't do things. Um, it's really, it's really a good way to get me to definitely do something <laughs> is to tell me that I can't do it. Uh, it's, it's really motivating for me. Um, so, you know, I, I practiced as a lawyer for a long time and I was involved in politics and people will say, well, you, you can't do both. And I was like, well, I guess we'll see about that. Um, you know, and then when I, I remember when I wanted to start doing angel investing and people said, well, you can't really be an investor unless you've been an investor. And I was like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, like how do you make new investors then? Um, and I, you know, sort of felt my way through starting to make angel investments and advising and built my portfolio of companies. Um, so that's always been a, a strong motivator as well. Yeah, I, I so appreciate, um, Adrian, where you just took us. You took us from sort of earliest days and, and realizing just what a what a gift you you are yourself, but what you've been given through this, this um, non-linear path of life. I mean, I don't want to <laughs> Sort of overlook the fact that you you were a very accomplished attorney. You you did migrate into taking those lessons into the most senior levels of our government and affecting policy. But all along too, you always had your eyes on entrepreneurship. That's yeah. kind of what I heard, either through yeah. investing, envisioning ways that we could use this intersection of these new emerging technologies better to affect mm -hmm. lives in positive ways. And it's just, it's such, it's so heartwarming to think that that was drawn from your earliest days and it's embedded in you. And you actually have always seemed to have the heart of the entrepreneur, yeah. even yeah. when you were in policy, even when you were affecting such public works. And um, I love this idea that you made the transition. Um, we're going to circle back to your policy work because I think that is really critically important. And also 
again, underscoring your how what a good investor you are today, even though someone told you, no, you can't be. <laughs> because you've had these nonlinear abstract um, yeah. opportunities, right? Mm-hmm. So, but really, if you take it back and you think about those lessons you learned as a child, marching through your, your career and your professional experiences, um, Isaac mentioned you were the chief business, you went as the chief business officer of state's title. Mm-hmm. Um, must have been a really interesting experience to go from one side of the house where there's form and shape yeah. to, you know, where, how do you operate into a new environment, um, which is, you know, a little bit of the wild west. Yes. Can you share with us a little bit of your, you know, what you learned being an entrepreneur? Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. No, it was quite the shift. You know, I you mentioned I was a, a lawyer on Wall Street, and that was very yeah. sort of institutional, very clear right. rules of the road. Um, and then to policy, where there it is a little bit, there's a lot of entrepreneurialism to be had in policy. And at the White House, partly because you're just dealing with so many things, um, and the problems are so tough. So you have to be a little entrepreneurial and creative. But there are still, right, it's a big, the government is a big bureaucracy, and there are norms under which somebody operates. Um, to Silicon Valley, where it's sort of you're just like figuring it out every day, all the time, um, and the ground is constantly shifting under your feet. Um, for me, I really wanted that experience. That was part of the appeal of of starting a company with a small group of people. Um, was just you know I knew it was going to be similar to the White House in in no two days would ever be the same, um, but that we were really building this infrastructure of this company. Um, from the ground up. And I sort of thought to myself, you know, I was coming out of government, you don't make a lot of money in government. Um, And I sort of thought, well, if it's, you know, a complete disaster um, in six months, like I won't really be any worse off, right? Right. At least financially (laughs) speaking. Um, So it felt like a good time to take the risk. And for me, I learned, you know, so much about executing. Right. And being agile and, and nimble as things change. Um, it was a really important experience to have. And it, it, so it informed um, the way I invest now and it informed the way I make a lot of decisions about my career going forward as well. Yeah, it's so fascinating too, to, to envision your 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 first day at work. Right. You've come out of these these places where there is the bureaucracy. There is, you know, there's always efficacy at the other at both sides. Right. Some outcome happens. Um, good or bad, but not always so, as you just said, in the journey of an entrepreneur in building a new company. And there's no playbook either, yeah. right? For when you talk about building the infrastructure, could what lessons would you kind of share? We're, we, we have a full house today of entrepreneurs. What lessons would you share for an individual who is coming in first off you know, you know, maybe it's out of school where they've had a lot of structure. There's a lot of entrepreneurs on the on the call today who are professional who had that structure. Yeah. Now they're in a place where they actually have to create something from nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say the most important thing I've learned is just start. Just do it. Um yeah. you which is not to say you shouldn't be prepared and you shouldn't analyze and you shouldn't have, you know, a PowerPoint deck and KPIs, right? All of those things are important, but yeah. none of it is a substitute for just starting and realizing that you're going to have to learn as you go, because there's just no amount of PowerPointing uh, <laughs> and, you know, metric analysis um, that substitutes for just starting and going and just doing as much as you can every day. Um, and I think it's a lesson I've taken into lots of other areas as well. Yeah, I I appreciate that. This idea of just continuing momentum. It's much easier once you get a rock rolling to continue to push it than it was when you first started pushing that rock. Um, Those, those days, they also must, they also are long. We know them as entrepreneurs. You know, when do you, you know, when do you kind of, where do you get your inspiration when you're, you're, you just, you keep going, where did you personally find inspiration to, you know, arguably really inform a great company. Yeah. 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 I, you know, for me, it goes back to the challenge of you can't, or nobody has ever, or yeah. this is impossible. Um, that always really fires me up. I don't know if it's because I'm a, a jock and it's the competitive <laughs> part of me. Um, but you know, we had a lot of that, um, 
at States Title, you know, we were using machine learning to underwrite title insurance, and it just it had never been done. The regulations didn't contemplate it. You know, we wanted to be an insurance underwriter, and people said, "Oh, well, it's you know, that's capital intensive, and that's not the way you should do it." And everybody else is thinking about insurance from the agency perspective. It was just a lot of you can't, you shouldn't, right? It's going to be hard to. Um, and I think the rest of the team felt like this too in those early days. Like, well, I, you know, I guess we'll just see. You know, maybe yeah. that's right, but I guess yep. we'll just see. And the only way to know is to is to just do it and try it. Yeah. Yeah. The internal fortitude point that you're not saying so overtly, but I'll call it out. Mm-hmm. It is it is a hallmark, again, of an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur who can't who wants to change the world. And obviously, you know, ostensibly, you've done that across a couple <laughs> categories of industry. Um, but I just love that you're reinforcing for us that when people say it's impossible, that's when you have to push through. Yeah. And that's when you keep moving. Um, one thing that I would I've really personally appreciated about you is that when someone says it can't be done, I actually see you in the center of a lot of those intractable problems. <laughs> For what it's worth, you show up at just the right time. When someone's like, no, we cannot, you know, we cannot create an inclusive, you know, widespread financial services sector. Or, you know, we have it, we we have the perfect uh, way that we, you know, whatever, design credit. And one of the ways I think you're doing that today is your work with the Financial Health Network. And what an important role that organization is playing for all of us as entrepreneurs, but is where there's underserved members of society. Um, And I just, if you'll share a little bit about your work there on the board and, and where this organization is heading, we would appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and and all credit to Jennifer Tesher, who's the founder and CEO of the Financial Health Network, which used to be called CFSI, the Center for Financial Services Innovation. Um, she really is the person who coined the phrase and this idea of financial health. I think previously we used to just talk about financial inclusion. Are people connected to a bank account is really the way we defined it. And Jennifer and the Financial Health Network are really responsible for making us think about this idea of, well, it's not enough just to be connected, right? Are those products and services serving people and all people and doing so equitably in a way that increases their financial health, their resiliency, their savings, their access to credit? Um, And she really has changed the dialogue around what we think about personal finance um, in this country. And it's become, you know, we saw it with the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, it was the sort of lack of personal health in the U.S. was really highlighted. Um, And again, with COVID, we've really unburied the inequities, um, right? They're they're not new. um, So that's why I say unburied. They've been there. And for those of us working in the space, we've always known about them. But for others who don't spend as much time thinking about these issues, COVID has unburied them. Um, And I think Part of what's so extraordinary about what Jennifer's done and the Financial Health Network has, has done is they do research and policy work, but they also fund fintechs aimed at improving consumer financial health. And so they counter this narrative of venture back companies, you know, being for a select group of people who maybe don't need as much help. Um, and they've decidedly taken an approach of thinking about fintech from the perspective of how does it improve consumer financial health and people's abilities to live the rest of their lives. Because we know that people's financial health is connected to their physical health, their mental well-being, their family life, their productivity at work, right? On and on and on. And so by addressing their financial health, they're getting at all these other issues that are so important to our abilities to live a good life. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, when I hear you say that, I I, want to, draw on a conversation we had yesterday in preparation for today. Um, you mentioned to us, which I thought was just an outstanding point. You you were speaking yesterday at the Aspen Institute, mm-hmm. really contemplating, again, this broader idea around um, inclusion. Yeah. And you noted, like, really, we may have it wrong in the fintech community about what we need to be building. The the products we we may not have it universally wrong, but there's a subtle twist you shared with us. I don't know if you could you could draw that out for the everyone who's here, but it was important to me and I think important for others to challenge our thinking. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's you know there's a couple of things. Is is one 
you know, unfortunately, we we don't yet have the diversity we need in terms of entrepreneurship, um, especially in the tech space. Um, and in terms of funding, right, and how those companies get funded and, and what gets funded, um, not just who gets funded. And so that's the first part of it, right? We tend to make and fund products for the coastal, well-off, Henry's, right, all of that. Um, and we leave out other parts of the country and other parts of the population, um, both from a funding perspective and just a product design perspective. Um the other thing that we talked about yesterday in our Aspen Institute conversation um, was this idea about financial literacy. Um, and it came up in the context of a policy discussion. And, you know, I, I made the point, um, maybe surprising some of my fellow panelists, but um, financial literacy is very important, um, we, especially when we think certainly back to the 2008 crisis and the way mortgage factored into some of the things happening there. Um, but I always say like nobody understands money better than poor and working class people, right? Um, and so we have this tendency to think, and I think this is true both from a policy perspective and from a fintech and private sector perspective, right? That people, for example, use payday loans because they don't know any better or because they don't understand how expensive and predatory they are. When in fact, of course, people understand how expensive and predatory they are. They're just the best of a bad set of options when you take into account cost and convenience and accessibility and all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I made the point yesterday that while the financial literacy conversation is important, um, it should not take the place of providing digital tools from the government and from the private sector that really help increase people's financial health. Yeah, so powerful. Because it, it, again, blends this, what we're, I think we're talking about, there's a constant through the story, Adrian, of your life and what you're doing today to lead us is that first off, you're empathetic. <laughs> you remember, you know, where, where things have been and where they come from. But then also this, this overlay of the use of emerging technologies mm -hmm. um, of really contemplating how we can reach at scale, these population and smart because I think you're, I have cold chills again when you just said that. Of course, the working poor and the poor understand because every penny matters. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of inspiration to be taken from your words about how we as entrepreneurs contemplate inclusiveness, product design. You know, where where do we invest our capital? What entrepreneurs do we try to seed? And maybe it's the ones who have actually know what it's like. Yes. As opposed to you said, the ones, you know where you could throw a rock and hit a venture capitalist. Maybe it's time to come in and create yeah. inclusiveness. Um, I want to remind everybody too, Adrian, Isaac is going to come back to us in about, you know, 10, 15 minutes with some questions from the audience. And okay. I think this probably is going to raise a lot of those, those questions. Yeah. Um, I know he has some too, but before we go there, I just want to draw that thread back through what I just said about you and, um, and what you what you took to advising into your advising role in the White House and what you learned from it, because I think what what we'll sense is, is that there are individuals who are really putting good ideas with policy into practice. So maybe we start with that experience and we'll walk, walk through a little bit of your other work. Yeah, yeah. I think for me. I mean, this point about empathy that you've made is such an important one. Um, and, you know, President Obama and I think like President Biden, right, have that in spades. Yeah. Um, just this understanding of what real life is like for people and um, the hardships, the, you know, all the highs and lows. Um, and that's so important in leadership and in policymaking generally and beyond the stump speeches, right? But really feeling what other people go through. Um, and I think those, you know, both President Obama and President Biden are just perfect examples of that. Um, and then for me, in terms of policymaking, like I, you know, I certainly thought about that too, and sort of the diversity of cultures and socioeconomic um, cultures that I had seen growing up. But also for me, it was important that I could bring up also my experience in the private sector into policymaking. Um, because for me, when we think about these really intractable problems, they can't be solved by just the public sector or just the private sector or just the nonprofit sector. You really need that cross-sectional approach um, if you're going to crack the really tough nuts. Um, and so I found it so useful, especially in financial policymaking, 
when we would talk about new policies and things that we wanted to do to be able to say, well, here's how the private sector, here's how the banking sector, here's how the asset management folks are going to react, right? And sometimes that means you change your approach. Sometimes it doesn't, but it's good to understand the interplay of all the stakeholders so that you can make the best decision. And the same is true if you're in the private sector, right? You want to understand how your government stakeholders are going to react um, mm -hmm. so that you can get to the best possible outcome. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, and, and interesting, you actually had a third dimension that you also led discussions on. Mm -hmm. I, I totally appreciate the private public partnership sector in West Virginia and rural America. That is oftentimes how problems get solved mm -hmm. is that natural point of collaboration. You yeah. added a third dimension, I think, was if my history lessons tell me the first time it had been discussed around using emerging technologies mm -hmm. in a more globalized fashion. So you also talked to, you had responsibility for introducing distributed ledgers or blockchain. Yeah. How, how did that go? <laughs> I mean, how yeah. did that go? We started saying, and now we got to use some tech. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I for me, FinTech in general and, and DLT as part of that, right, presented such an opportunity because the way we typically think about the financial sector in policy is sort of the list of no-nos. All right, what are the things that you don't want financial sector actors to do? I felt like fintech, uh, distributed ledger represented this opportunity to set an affirmative agenda. Okay, what do we want financial services to do for consumers, for markets? And now we have, right, it was such an interesting time if you think about even the advent of Facebook and the iPhone and Amazon really catching steam and the financial crisis, like all happened within a five year period of one another. Um, I think people forget because we're so used to these objects and services now, but like all of that happened pretty quickly. So fast forward um, to my time in, in the White House, and I just thought, this is our chance to really shape this industry for good, as Pollyanna as it sounds, right? Yeah. And to make it inclusive. So, you know, I think people in government, rightfully, are always very cognizant of risks. Um, and so I think the challenging thing when you have new and emerging technologies, DLT, AI, is to be able to speak to those risks, many of which are unknown, but also trying to figure out how you as government can harness the potential for good when you're not necessarily driving the development of it. Um, so again, for me, it was important that we were bringing in voices from across government, but also from the private sector, from the nonprofit sector, bringing in technologists to like just really explain to us how things were working. Um, and then thinking about, okay, are there government use cases, especially for DLT? So that task force really felt like, what are the government use cases for DLT? Um, and then generally, what are the policy outcomes we want to see come out of this, right? So yes, be cognizant of the risks of AI, but how might it help us meet our policy objectives as well? Yeah, it's it's so critically important to have all those voices at the table. Um, I think I've heard you add. I know I've heard you advocate for there is also another voice that needs to be at the table. And I think that when we see the application, these very wise applications of AI and ML, um, we need to really recognize at our own peril, if we don't, the importance of inclusivity and diversity as we're building these out these technologies. Any thoughts there on on how you've evolved your thinking or what you were thinking then? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, continue to believe that having diverse perspectives around the table um, is incredibly important, especially because we sort of, you know, if you're in the technology space, go to certain schools, you live in certain cities, you you take certain information for granted or you make certain assumptions that are not broadly applicable. And unless you have, you know, women, people of color, LGBTQ people, right? Poor and working class people, right? Unless you have that true diversity of perspectives, you don't have anybody to sort of call out the assumptions that you make that then make up the premise or the foundation of what you're building. And, you know, like with building a house or any structure, if the foundation is off, everything is off. Um, so you need that, those diverse group of stakeholders. And, you know, we've got so much work to do here. I mean, and you and I have sort of joked about this in the past, and it's a common joke. If you think about financial services and tech, probably some of the least diverse industries right. historically, right? And you put them together, 
you know, you have a real problem. But I think, you know, after uh, last summer with George Floyd, the conversations around this have just changed so, so much. And I'm really encouraged by that. But there's still, right, it's one thing to change a conversation, but we still have to do a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm heartened that the groundwork was set with a lot of the policy that you influenced. As you mentioned, we've had some tragedy in between, but we're seeing industry come together to um, really focused on this idea that we have a responsibility yeah. as the industry. And you and I both know we are always the, oftentimes the one woman at the table. Yeah. Usually when you and I are together, there's two of us at least. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we double, we 100% grow the pot. Yeah. But uh, but what was so what's so wonderful? Oh, I hope and I have this belief is is that we're moving towards really true efforts against a more inclusive fintech. Yeah. Um, and financial services sector, just to kind of focus in on, and by extension, um, really tackle some of those challenges. Is there any place you think we should, we could be focused as entrepreneurs to kind of galvanize that support and, and really push for diversity? Is it, is it hiring? Is it investing? What's the, what are the yeah. areas? Yeah. You know, I think it's hard to think of the the one thing. It's sort of an all of the above approach. You know, I think it's it's hiring, it's investors, you know, stretching beyond their their networks when they're hiring into their firms as well as when they're making investors. It's, you know, when we think about our service providers, right? You're hiring a law firm and if the team at the law firm only looks one way saying, "Look, we're your client." We want this team to be diverse. So pushing your service providers um, to bring diversity to the table, right? And and seeking it out ourselves. I mean, there's so many ways that you, there's so many stakeholders in entrepreneurship and in tech, right? You've got your advisors, your board of directors, your investors, your, right, your team. Right. Um, so there's lots of opportunities, um, you know, and I think people get stuck because they say, well, I don't know any X, right? Black right. people, Latinx people, women, whatever it is um, in this space. Um, and it's really just because their networks are too closed off. So it takes work for them to bust out of their networks. But right, that talent, those people are there. Totally, totally. And 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 what you just said, do the work, really bring us to it. A new place with your, you know, with your ability and, and broaden it. But I can't think of a better segue, by the way. Um, by the way, my paper keeps falling. I don't know if anyone here is <laughs> crashing. I'm not dying. I have a notebook that keeps falling off my desk. <laughs> um, so we're going to wing it from here on out. But okay, okay for you. <laughs> so, but, but I do want to make that natural segue while I blush. Um, you just said a thesis for us of the future. Right. What can we be doing? It's in, it's in, it's incumbent upon all of us to actually make the effort. But you're actually making the effort. You've been asked to contemplate what the central bank of the future might look like. Yeah. That is a big, hairy, scary idea. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to? We're you know we're gonna we'll talk about this. We'll go to your thesis on investing and then turn it over to the audience for right. questions. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, so my uh, the grant I have with the Gates Foundation, along with Michael Barr at the University of Michigan, um, is this, it's called the Central Bank of the Future, um, and it's really meant to think about how central banks around the world can leverage technology to make financial inclusion more a core part of their remit. Um, you know, we often think about central banks; it's monetary policy right? Yeah. Payments and supervision of financial institutions. And a lot of them do work around financial inclusion, but sort of programmatic. And we don't think of it as one of the core pillars of their mission. Right. Um, right. And so the Gates Foundation came to us and said, okay, well, how do we change that? Start with a blank slate, think, you know, 50, 100 years down the road, how could you use technology to make financial inclusion part of the core of what central banks do? Um, and I think both Michael and I were like, well, that, that's a big one. <laughs> that, uh, but they gave us two years <laughs> to think it through. Um, you know, but I think a big part of it is um, leveraging technology and different voices around the table yeah. to think, well, OK, if you've got, you know, financial stability, how does an inclusive financial system factor into stability, which is a core part of what central banks do? Okay, payment systems, 
right? And we think about mobile payments and and the way that's emerged, you know, especially in in underdeveloped parts of the world, right? I mean that that and financial inclusion connect up very clearly. Of course, now conversations about central bank digital currency and how much faster yeah. we might get money into people's pockets or how we might target different pla- different parts of the population um, yeah. with sort of discrete monetary policy using central bank digital currency. Um, there's so many interesting questions there. Um, and yeah. it's been such a wonderful time working with the Gates Foundation um, and central banks across the world to, to try and make some progress here. Yeah, AJ, I just so value that vision. And you, you mentioned a perfect example, how to get money in the hands of people quicker. Yeah. And, and circling back to what we know is, is that no one wants to go to a payday lender. Right. Why couldn't, why do we not have a system and rails for payments that actually pay people the day they work? Do you know, I mean, I think, you know, if you think about lifting people out of poverty, we certainly know it, it takes individuals and thinkers like you to contemplate how we put this technology to work in the construct of a central bank idea um, that is focused on Main Street, right? As much as it is, as our macro and regional influences. Um, And and you actually happen to be putting your money where your mouth is, I might add. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You are are really leading us in thinking about how to close uh, the venture capital gap um, and investing yourself. Maybe we just round it out with your thesis there and then turn over. I, I think there's a bunch of questions. Everyone's kind of pounding me on my phone to get off and <laughs> let you answer questions. All right. Yeah. We'll be, we'll be yeah. brief on this one. Um, you know, for me, I really, I first and foremost, I, I look to invest in entrepreneurs that I like and I feel like have this empathy muscle, well exercised and well developed. Um, that's sort of the, you know, the first threshold for me. And then are they doing something truly innovative, right? Um, so you're unlikely to see me investing in a food delivery app um, at, at some point, right? But like, are they doing something truly innovative that I think can actually make a difference um, for, you know, for the way people engage with their finances? Because there's just nothing, or, you know, other than physical health and mental health, right? There's just nothing more personal and emotional um, than our money. And so for me, it's, you know, how are you making money easier to deal with? How are you making it easier to conduct your financial affairs? Because as we said earlier, everything else, right, really does flow from that. So for me, it's first, like, do I like the entrepreneurs? Do they have a a well-developed empathy muscle? And then are they doing something truly innovative around financial health? Yeah, I so appreciate that. We can move a lot of people off of distress, as you talked about in the bad outcomes. Um, I. I want to thank you. I'm not going to go away, but I'm going to turn it back to Isaac. But Adrian, thank you. You inspire me every day to do something good. Mm-hmm. Um, you lead by example. And we are just so honored and blessed that you joined us today. But Isaac, I bet there's a bunch of questions or people are like, <laughs> enough. Stop talking, Sarah. Oh, we got plenty. Of it. it was kind of frustrating. You kept picking all of mine as you guys were discussing. I was like, oh, dang. <laughs> just kept checking them off. <laughs> um <laughs> But we do have some pretty good questions. I, I think we have a lot of like young people tuning in who kind of have some questions regarding, uh, you know, that advice that Adrian might have for people who are uh, specifically people of color and women who might be that one person of color at the table, um, that one woman at the table. What are the keys to, you know, a advocating, but also achieving success in those more traditional spaces? And we can focus that more on tech and uh, fintech if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's no doubt about it. It's it's hard to be the only woman, to be the only person of color, or as my grandmother used to say, when you've got the double whammy, right, as a woman of color. Um, there's no doubt about it. it's hard when you look, you know, every room you walk into, you're like, yep, just me, just me, right? And it does really start to to wear on you. Um, you know, I I try to stay inspired by thinking, you know, but I have to be here so that tomorrow it's not just me. And so I, I have to sort of tough through it so that, you know, tomorrow there's there's two of us. As Sarah said, we double, we double the population in the room, right? And the day after, um, we'll triple it. Um, so, I you know, I'm not sure I have much, much better advice than just to say, you know, you got to tough it out, um, but find your your allies and your, your friends and your sisters in arms um, that you can talk to. Like you need that safe space that when you come out of that room where you're the only you can call a good friend like Sarah um, and sort of talk 
talk about it and, and get advice both on the substance of what you're doing, but on the emotional piece of, of having to be the only. Um, I do hear a lot of young people often say, well, they don't want to engage in a space where they're the only because they think it indicates something about the company or the space, like they're more comfortable being in a place where there are lots of them. Um, and I think that's valid, right? People need to know themselves and where they're more comfortable and where they're going to be their best selves. Um, but I would also push back a little bit and say, like, look, if there's a space you want to be in and where you can make an impact, um, try not to be deterred by being the only. And as my dad would always say, like, put on your helmet and pads and get in there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, love, I love a little football analogy, um, <laughs> which I guess transitions really well into our next question. Um, you know, with the situation happening in Texas, um, the national conversation on the reliability of our infrastructure has um, really intensified. And so how have these issues reflected uh, in our current financial system and, and what role can fintech play in making up for those shortcomings? Yeah, yeah that's no, such an important question. Um, you know, our financial infrastructure, right, is also pretty dated and fragile. I mean, dated is not necessarily the issue they have in Texas. There's, you know, a bunch of other uh, issues at play there. But when we think about, you know, we were talking about payday lending, when we think about our payment rails and the fact that you can put money in a bank, but those funds not be available to you until three days later. You know, if you're well off and you've got a buffer, that doesn't matter. But if you're living to paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, the way most Americans are, that three days is the ball game, right? And so you have to go to a check cash or you have to go to a payday lender. And so when we think about financial infrastructure, there's so much we need to do in the US to modernize and digitize our financial infrastructure. And we just, we can't afford to rest on our laurels. And just to tie it back to, to Texas, right? There's a, there's a wonderful nexus as we think about upgrading our energy infrastructure to renewables um, and our financial infrastructure, right? And the way those things play together, the way you can leverage DLT to help finance uh, renewable energy infrastructure to bring people's energy costs down. So there's like a just like a wonderful world in the connection between energy infrastructure and financial infrastructure that is just in early days. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so this next question is, you know, what are some of the financial services and fintech companies that uh, you've worked with that really excite you by making, you know, diversity a primary goal of theirs? Yeah, um, you know, one of my favorite favorite companies that I've been so lucky to be involved with is uh, Nova Credit. Um, they do credit score translation for immigrants to the U.S., right? So if you're coming from another country, you maybe have a very high credit score in your home country and you get to the U.S. and the credit bureaus and lenders basically say, we don't know how to translate this. So you effectively have no credit, um, even though you're perfectly credit worthy, right? So they've figured out a way through, through partnerships and their technology to translate that so that immigrants can get credit. Um, in addition to just their their mission and the diversity that that implies, one of their founders, uh, Nikki, is is a woman um, and an immigrant, um, right? So they really walk walk the walk every day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess it's kind of a follow up to that question: Is there anything on the policy side that's really been exciting you recently? Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm I'm excited that the Fed is continuing to push down the real-time payments uh, uh, avenue. Um, I hope they continue to do that and, and accelerate that. I think you know, a lot of the climate and finance discussions, as I mentioned earlier, are really taking on new life, um, exploring you know, alternative means of underwriting uh, for credit, being mindful of the potential for discrimination and privacy concerns. But I do think getting us beyond FICO and being able to take into account and mitigate the sort of uh, historical inequities as we think about credit, right, as a, a future indicator for people. Um, so the policies and regulations that are going to allow for some of those things, they are really exciting. Yeah. And do you feel like there's, you know, some unique opportunities here in areas like Appalachia to make those things happen? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think if you have entrepreneurs from from those areas, going back to the discussion with Sarah, right? That empathy, that and that firsthand experience with how does this problem play out in real time, and like what's a solution that's actually workable for me and people like me? There's just no substitute, right? There's no advanced degree that substitutes for that sort of firsthand experience and knowledge when you're talking about solving problems. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
and we have this other one here, you know, as on a more personal note, um, what were some of those biggest, more personal challenges that you faced when you first started your entrepreneurial journey? Um, you know, with your extremely impressive background, did you find yourself the victim of early success? Um, and how did you adapt to those new challenges as they came up? Yeah, I definitely never felt, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, I like I've always appreciated some of the things I've I've been able to accomplish, but I've I've always sort of just been hungry for more. So I've never really thought of things as successes as much as like this is what I'm doing now and and what I've done. And you know, when when my mother was around, she was never really impressed. Um, and that sounds horrible, but she was always like, you know, what else? There's more here. There's more here. Um, so she never let me get to, uh, never let me pat myself on the back too much, but I would say, um, you know, those challenges of, um, we talked about, you know, being a woman, being a person of color, those are constant. Um, but also having this nonlinear career, like we talked about, I think people, even though we think about work very differently these days, people have, you know, more jobs in their careers than they have historically, but we still think about things pretty, pretty linearly, right? Like this is what you do. You do marketing or you're a lawyer, right? Um, and when you try and swerve in and out of different lanes, um, people don't really know how to interpret it or they'll, they'll tell you that you can't do it. And there are, there aren't that many models out there. Um, and so not having, you know, a model, um, can be challenging. Yeah. I think we have one more question here. Yes. Uh, so why do we generally tend to uh, pigeonhole, uh, you know, working class people into more brick and mortar financial technology or just finances in general? Oh, that is the best question. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. I I, mean, I that's, that's the answer I have is I have no idea why we do that. Um, and I'll try not to get on too much of a soapbox here. Right. But if, yeah. you know, if well-off people can conduct their financial lives, right, from one of these, equity would suggest that we want, you know, we want everybody to be able to do that. So to say that, well, you know, if you're working class or poor or you, you know, you live in a rural area that you should be limited to just a bank branch or a post office, right, to a physical footprint 20 minutes away from you with limited business hours and, you know, we're going to assume that all technology is predatory, so we don't want you to have access to that. I mean, it's just the worst. To use a very technical term, it's the worst, um, and 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 I think short-sighted. Um, you know, there are certainly risks with any digital technology, and policymakers and innovators need to be mindful of those. But there's no doubt that the that the ease and the opportunity that comes from being able to have a digital financial life, um, it's going to be so empowering for so many people. So we should not be limiting populations to brick and mortar financial services by any stretch. And it, if we didn't know that before COVID, we should definitely know it now. Absolutely. No, I love that idea of just approaching this with equity in it and how if if the wealthy can, you know, attack right, it. If it's good enough for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It should be know? good enough for everybody. Yeah question um well I can go that's... forever on that one. Oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i totally get that but um that's definitely i think a good spot to wrap up for us um adrian let me first say like a massive thank you uh you undoubtedly inspired a lot of people today um i know i personally am i'm, I'm really hung up on that line that uh too much to he was given much much as expected i i think that's really going to sit with me for a while um so thank you thank you thank you uh for taking the time to be with us today